What's up, everybody? Video is now live. Good to see everybody tonight. Hopefully, people will be joining in here in just a moment. If you are tuning in and this is not live, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch and uh, opening up the Word of God together. And uh, what's up, Mr. Cogdale? Good to see you, brother. Hope you are doing well and your family's doing well. Hornberger, what's going on? How's it going? Michaela, Josh, good to see everybody. Jamie, Ava, uh, what's going on? Elizabeth, hope everybody's doing well. Hope everybody's doing encouraging. What's up, Jen Skowski? It's good to see you. Miss Cindy, how are you? Miss Amy, good to see everybody. Hey, listen, if you're tuning into this and uh, you're not watching this live, uh, of course, we're recording this live, but then it'll be saved. Or, or if you're listening uh, on the app, um, just want to thank you for taking the time to listen. Uh, we're, we just give a moment or two for people to log in since we are recording this live. People log in and they watch. And so just want to take a couple moments for that uh, as we build our viewers up. Take a moment. If you are live here, shoot me a thumbs up, or shoot me a heart or something uh, just to show some love and see what's going on. Uh, good to have everybody this Wednesday evening. Mr. Wright, good to see you. Miss Loveless, uh, the Vest family. I'm hoping it's the Vest family. I know Abby joins in, but I hope the Vest family is watching. I'm sure that'll be uh, a great blessing. Uh, good to see everybody on this Palm Sunday. Uh, super awkward not being in the same area on Palm Sunday, um, but uh, nevertheless, um, uh, it, it kind of gives you a little bit of uh, a feeling, what's up Miss Karina Clayton, kind of gives you a little bit of a feeling of maybe what the first century church went through, not in the scope of persecution at all, but in the scope of um, just dealing with not being able to gather all the time and not being together uh, constantly. And so um, it gives you a little bit of a feeling uh, as to what that might be like. What's up? Miss Keys and the Keys family, good to see everybody. Uh, what's going on, Lucas Johnson? Um, just waiting for everybody to load up and, and load in and get ready to get going here. It's just a couple minutes past. People are getting used to Miss Abigail Hughes, good to see you. Miss uh, Judith Hamilton, good to see you. Um, uh, before, when we would go live, it would literally take, you know, 10 minutes for people to everybody log on but now we're kind of getting the hang of this thing and i'll tell you one of my thoughts in all of this is i'm processing all the sh sh like subtle shifts that we've had to make um there are some really beneficial things that has taken place uh, because of this uh covid ordeal and being quarantined and so there have been beneficial platforms that we've utilized that we're going to continue to utilize after this uh and so um uh, I think that that'll be a, a great blessing uh, to move forward in ministry utilizing these platforms. Of course, when we come back together, we want to come back physically, absolutely, uh, but definitely also um, uh, utilize some things uh, on social media. I think the daily encouragement or the weekly encouragement of multiple times encouraging is a great blessing and a great benefit. And uh, doing this, of course, live streaming while the service is going on, I think that's something we're going to try to keep as well. Uh, I think, you know, we're just trying to think through some things right now. But good to see everybody. We're going to open up in a word of prayer here in about maybe two minutes. Give just a little bit of time to log on. If you have not already, uh, what I tell my students is make sure you go to the bathroom so you're not getting up in the middle of this and going to the bathroom and breaking your string of con con concentration. Have your Bibles with you. And uh, also, hi, Mr. Thelma Lynch. Good to see you. Um, Bridget, good to see you, Miss Bridget. Uh, have your Bibles and then maybe have a notebook or if you have an iPad uh, like I do, have an extra iPad around, have an iPad and um, uh, take some notes, record some notes. Uh, I like to give one-liners or I like to give some things that say, hey, take note of this. And uh, those are things I want you to ponder and think on after the, the message is done. Um, I, I like it. If you tune in on Wednesday, I like to get up and move around and hoot and holler and shout. But uh, So sitting down is different. However, in the Bible, in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament, they sat down. It was a Jewish custom to sit down uh, and teach and service. So um, uh, this is interesting, kind of learning a new, new platform here. But nevertheless, we are here and uh, we are encouraged to continue on in the message. So take your Bibles, if you have them, run with me to Malachi chapter number three. Malachi chapter three. Believe it or not, the book of Malachi uh, is quite interesting. It is the precursor to Christmas. I don't think I've ever heard a Christmas series uh, through Malachi. 
But believe it or not, that's the word that God gives to set up the birth of the Messiah in the New Testament. Mind-blowing, because it, it ends with the word curse. It just does nothing but reprimand uh, the uh, Israelites over and over and over again. And so uh, it's, just, it's just interesting uh, to look into the book of Malachi as God's uh, set up for the coming of the Messiah. And so it just blows my mind uh, that this is... Um, this is what Malachi is about. So take your Bibles, run with me to Malachi. Chapter number three is where we're going to be at. And when you get there, shoot me a thumbs up, a like, uh, so I know that we will begin. It's about time. We gave him five minutes to log on. We're, we're going to go on. People log on as we go on. Just want to make a couple announcements as you're turning your Bibles to Malachi 3. Uh, we have a couple really cool things we're going to be unfolding this week as we're probably going to be in this ordeal for a week, two, three, whatever uh, in the near future. Um, uh, some of the things we're going to do for student ministry, Wednesdays we are going to have um, a fellowship after Bible fellowship. So check this out. We are going to have Bible fellowship like normal. Right, Take 30, 40 minutes or so, talk about what it is we're going to talk about. Right now we're in the teenage years of Jesus. Awesome study. I want you to dive in on what it is. And then uh, we're going to have a guy Zoom breakout and a lady Zoom breakout. And we'll make sure to put those um, uh, IDs in there. And then uh, what will happen is, is after the Bible Fellowship, you're going to log into Zoom. And one of my leaders are going to be leading the Bible Fellowship breakout. And that's going to be something we're going to try to carry on. When we get back together uh, physically on Wednesdays, we're going to try to do some more breakout studying. I know you guys love that at camp, but we're going to try to carry that through uh, here in the very uh, near future. Of course, Sundays we have service like this. We have a couple things coming up throughout the week. Uh, and this is so cool. This week we are going to be having a virtual revival services so you're going to have your pastors, Pastor uh, uh, Phyllis, Pastor Josh, myself, and then Pastor Mike are going to be preaching this week. And I get the privilege of having Good Friday. And I believe, uh, if the Lord allows and permits, uh, I believe that we're going to hold a virtual candlelight service. I think that's going to be awesome. I got to think through some details, but I want it to be as engaged as possible. So virtual candlelight service. Let me know what you think about that. I think that'd be really, really uh, awesome time. Take your Bibles, Malachi chapter three. We're going to open in a word of prayer. So wherever you are right now, don't got to be in the church. You can pray to God anywhere. Of course, take time right now, bow your head, close your eyes. I'm going to pray. Uh, this is what I want to encourage you to pray. Okay, ready? Say, God, Speak to me. Speak to me. Is everything that I'm going to say uh, going to be applicable to your life? No. It might not be applicable to you, but it definitely is for you. It's not applicable to you, but it's definitely for you. So, in other words, it might not be applicable right now, but it will be applicable in the future, or it will be applicable uh, tomorrow, or maybe it's been applicable in the past, whatever it might is. Uh, but just take time as I pray and just say, God, speak. God, speak. Let's pray. Father, we invite you into this service. We are distant from each other in physicality, but we are near to each other in spirituality. Dear God, I pray that you speak to us, speak to me, help me use this message to convict our hearts and draw us closer to you and, and help us in the process of sanctification, Lord. I pray that the uh, Instagram and Facebook feeds don't get interrupted, Jesus. I pray that they stream well, and I pray those sitting in, at home will receive a great blessing tonight, Lord, all for your glory, Jesus, that your name would be magnified and glorified and high and lifted up among uh, the people that will be uh, 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 live streaming right now. And then, Lord, I pray for those that are watching that might not know you as Savior, dear God, that you would stir them, Lord, to the desire to know you as Savior. We thank you. We praise you in advance for what you're going to do. And Lord, I ask, Father, for your great blessing to rain down upon us. We pray this in the name above every name, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Good to see everybody. Malachi chapter 3. Hey, let me throw this at you. Uh, you might think this is interesting to hear this, but according to the FBI statistics, uh, burglaries take place uh, three times every minute. Uh, every minute there are three burglaries that take place in the United States. That makes about 3,757 burglaries, according to the FBI, every single day. And, and by the time that this message is over, it's arguable that we'll be between 180 and 200 burglaries that have taken place just within this short period of time. And a uh, year long, as the FBI ran statistics, year long burglary, it's over 1.3 million burglaries 
over the course of a year. That's crazy. It is the second highest crime committed in the United States. First is larceny. Second is burglary. On the average burglary, I learned this this week, uh, a person loses between $2,400 and $2,500 on the average burglary. Uh, people steal. People rob. People break in and take things that aren't theirs. As a matter of fact, I want to challenge you to think about this. Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? Now, you don't have to self-incriminate and say, yes, I have, and put some, but, but just think about it. Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? In the legal sense, would you be considered a robber? Would you be considered a robber? Probably all of us has, believe it or not. If we look at our past and say, well, I, I took this pen, or I took this paper, or I took this item, or maybe you intentionally stole something and pocketed and pickpocketed, whatever it might be, uh, and stole something. But, but in a legal sense, would you be considered a robber? Well, well, let me ask you this, not just on a legal scale, but what about in the spiritual scale? Would you be considered somebody that robs God. Look with me real quick in verse number 8, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8. God says, will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Then what? Yet ye have robbed me. God teaches us that we as a people can actually rob him. We can be considered spiritual robbers of God. Now, in Malachi chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through verse 12. Uh, God is once again dealing with his people Israel. Israel has been disobedient. Israel has went wayward from the Lord. God is once again coming in with a corrective word, and he's speaking to Israel to get them corrected. Let me give you this situation. Israel was not giving to God the way that they were supposed to give to God. They were not storing the resources of of God the way that they are supposed to store the resources of God. And this doesn't just happen to deal with their finances. A lot of times when preachers preach this section, they only focus on a famous verse in uh, verse 8 and then in verse 10. Uh, however, let me tell you this, it is so much deeper we're going to learn tonight than just their financial resources. God is teaching them that they've robbed him on different levels. Uh, but God is speaking to Israel. The Israelite people were not storing the resources that God gave them in accordance with God's word. And God in verse 8 says that they have robbed God. So God is considering what they're doing as robbery against him. I, I wonder this, if in the United States, uh, three times every minute a physical robbery takes place, I wonder how many times our souls rob God every minute or uh, of every day by not living in obedience and in accordance with his word. When it comes to our relationship, when it comes to our resources. Wow. You want to talk about convicting, right? You want to talk about getting to the heart of the matter. Uh, in the physical sense, we might be considered robbers, but definitely in the spiritual sense, God is addressing his people here in Malachi saying, you have robbed me in these ways. The Israelites were once again out in their relationship with God and God is speaking to them to address it. And there's four areas he addresses we're going to look at tonight. God addresses first the relationship. Number two, God addresses the resources. Number three, God addresses the result. And then number four, God addresses the reward. So if you're taking notes, here's the outline. God addresses the relationship, the resource, the result, and the reward. So let's jump right into it. Verses six through uh, uh, 12. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may, may be meat in mine house, and prove me now. Now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall be no room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Notice this, and all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Host, my soul, let's unpack this. First thing God addresses in verse 6 and 7, he addresses 
Israelites' relationship with him. God starts out this section by revealing two things, who he is and then who the Israelites were. Look at verse 6. He says, for I am the Lord thy God, I change not. He says, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. So this uh, puts on display for us something in the theological world we call the attributes of God, right? The attributes of God are what makes God up. Okay, what is God? What is, how does he function? What parameters has he set upon himself? This is an attribute of God, the unchangeableness of God. In the theological world, we say the immutability of God, that God cannot change. Why? Why can God not change? Because God is perfect. There's no need for God to change. We change because we get better or we get worse. That's why we change. But God is eternally perfect. Therefore, God has no need to get better because he can, and he cannot have absolutely get worse because he is absolute perfection on all scale of eternity. So God is allowed to say, I am God, I change not. But then what does he do? He not just reveals who he is, I'm God and I don't change, but then he talks to the Israelites. He says first in verse 6, ye sons of Jacob, ye sons of Jacob. That phrase, ye sons of Jacob, is a derogatory phrase to the Israelites. It's, it's re re literally a title of rebuke because of the disobedience. Jacob was their founding father. His name turned to Israel after he got right with God and wrestled with God and God called his name Israel. The children of Israel, the nation of Israel, Therefore, when God calls them the children of Israel, it is a term of endearment and a term of blessing. But when God says you're the son of Jacob, it's a derogatory term. It is a term saying you are currently in disobedience to me. So he says, I'm God, I'm perfect, and I'm not changing. But you, on the other hand, need some help. He says, even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinance. That word phrase gone away there in Hebrew means to turn aside, to turn away, or to depart from. In other words, they have departed from the unchanging God. They have a relational struggle with God, and it's not because God has changed. It's because they have departed from God, and they've turned away. They've stepped out on their relationship from God, even from the days of their fathers. In other words, this is a generational problem. The founding fathers uh, stepped away from God. The, the Their great-great-grandfather stepped away. Their grandfather stepped away, and now they find themselves in disobedience with God. God says, you've gone away from my ordinance and have not kept them. The phrase have not kept means you've not preserved them. Or another way your Bible translates it often in the Old Testament is you've not observed to do. You've not observed to do. You've not kept them to heart and actually lived them out. So God uh, kind of gives them a relationship status here. I am God. I change not because I am perfect. You on the other hand need help. You are the disobedient children of Jacob. You've gone away from my uh, ordinance and you have stepped out of and not observed my word. He, he, here's, here's what I want you to know. Israel's relationship status currently right here in Malachi 3 was a state of rebellion toward God. Let me give you a lesson real quick. Ready? Daily renewal guards against departed rebellion. Daily renewal guards against departed rebellion. Why is that? Because Israel has been through a lot with God up to this point. I mean, they've been called out of the uh, uh, from Abraham. They've been placed in um, uh, it, uh, Egypt on a time of famine so God could keep them uh, steadfast and going when there was no food. And then they cried out to God and God redeemed them through Moses, brought them out of the land of Egypt, and then they went on into the promised land, but yet they failed that. And so God took care of them, wandering for 40 years, and then God allowed them to go into the promised land and conquer their enemies and live in abundant uh, a kingdom there, and then they, they went wayward and wayward and wayward, and they went into exile, and after exile, they got brought back, and here we are with them being brought back and have the favor of the king so they can rebuild their nation. They've been through a lot with God, and yet still, they are in rebellion against God. What does that tell me? You need daily renewal, not just once in a while. You can't just look back and say, man, five years ago, I was right with God. Three years ago, one week ago, I was right with God. These people have been through a lot with God, yet here currently, they are finding themselves in a rebellious status when it comes to God. 
Israel's relationship with God is one of rebellion. But here's what fascinates me the most. Ready? When you look at this text, you see the fatherly heart of God to a rebellious and wayward children. The fatherly heart of God to the rebellious and wayward children. In chapters 1, verse uh, 6, I believe it is, and then chapter 2 and verse 10, God is called the Father there. He's called the Father. Uh, in, in other words, so we think this concept in the New Testament, Jesus says, pray to your Father is some new concept. It's not. All throughout the Old Testament, uh, God is called the Father, and, and it's displayed the relationship, and it's the display how he deals with his children. And not only do we read about God being Father in Malachi chapter 1 and 2, but now we see the fathership of God displayed in Malachi chapter 2 by how he handles the disobedient children. Notice first two things God addresses here to his wayward children. Look at verse 6. He addresses their standing with God, or what we call the security with God. He says, listen, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. In other words, they're rebellious, they've gone away, they've turned away from the word of God, and God says the only reason why you're not consumed is not because of who you are, but because of who I am. I am God. I made a covenant with your fathers. I chose to love you. I chose to provide for you. And I will be here for you, not because of who you are, but because of who I am. In other words, listen to me here, Christian. God gives them security. He gives them relationship before he gives them rebuke. And so he steps out and says, uh, there's a security level here. I'm about to address some things in your life, and you are in desperate need of these things to be addressed, but I'm going to let you know you're secure in me. The only reason why you're not consumed right now is because God is God. That's what he's saying. I don't change. I'm not just going to sporadically off of my emotions. I'm not going to make a decision to destroy you. I am your God and I promise to be faithful. So he talks about their security, but then he talks about their standing in verse 7. He says here in verse 7, uh, you've gone away. You've not kept them. You need to return to me. So multiple times he's saying, listen, I'm God. I change not. But you, on the other hand, have gone astray. You, on the other hand, has stepped away. So even though though they are in a good standing with God because they're standing in the grace of God that is unchangeable, not because of who we are, but because of who God is. Their status with God is one of rebellion. Let me tell you this, Christian. You need to hear this. Ready? You can be right with God through Jesus Christ eternally, however, have a daily struggle because you're disobedient. Let me say that again. You can have a right relationship with God eternally because of who Jesus is. You stand in the grace of God, as Roman teaches us. However, you can have a day-to-day -day struggle with God because of your current rebellion. So God, in his fatherly heart, says, I'm God. You do not have to fear me of destroying you. However, you do need to change your relationship status right now. You need to get back on track. So as a loving father, God does not bring callous destruction. He brings a call of direction direction to them. Look with me in verse number seven, the end of verse seven. God says to them, return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Return to me and I will return to you. That phrase return there means to turn back, to recover, to restore. It's actually a military term, which means about face. In other words, you're heading in one direction, but then boom, you need to about face and come back to me. You're a wayward. You've gone astray. You stepped out of the way that you're supposed to be, but now you need to return. God, in other words, is calling Israel to repent of their uh, rebellious relationship with him. God is calling them to repentance here. They robbed God in their relationship by being rebellious, and so what does God do? God calls them to repentance. Let me give you two lessons real quick, and we're going to go on to the next point. Number one is this, what we learned from here. Real restoration in your relationship with God cannot happen outside of repentance. Real relationship, a uh, real uh, uh, restoration in your relationship with Jesus cannot happen outside of repentance. In other words, you cannot embrace the Lord if you're faced the opposite direction. If you're clinging on to the world, if you're clinging on to sin, if you're clinging on to self, you're not going to be able to fully embrace the Lord because you're headed in the opposite direction. And I want you to notice this aspect of mercy. God's telling him, when you return, when you repent to me, notice this. 
I will return unto you. In other words, God's saying, I'm not going anywhere. I'm here. I will return unto you if you repent unto me. If you turn back to me, I'm there. I'm there and you can have mercy. I like the way I'm reminded Proverbs uh, chapter number 28 and verse number 13 says this. Let me write, write this down. You know, it's Proverbs 28 and verse number 13. It says, he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. In other words, if I turn and, and I confess, that means call it what it is. Stop sugarcoating your rebellion. Say, God, I've sinned against you. I've struggled against you. And then forsake them. Turn from them. Repent of those sins. God says what? He shall find or he shall have mercy. God says, you return to me, I will return to you. My soul, he's saying, man, if you return, I'm there. I'll meet you. That's an aspect of mercy. I like this verse. Write this down. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 17. A verse you know well, but here's a, a word we often overlook in this verse. It says this, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, all things are passed away. Notice this. Behold, all things are become new. Now, if you have your Bibles right now, I'd underline that word, behold, because a lot of times we read over that. It says, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things become new. No, it says, behold, all things become new. In other words, when you get right with the Lord and you repent of your sins and you're in a right relationship with God, behold, things have become new. What does behold mean? You can see it. It's visible. There's real, actual repentance. You're not just saying, I'm right with God. You're living out rightness with God. And so he's telling you, when you get right, there's a beholding that should take place. People should see a difference in your life when you come to faith in Jesus Christ. And Christian, hear me, when you get right with God through a struggle that you have, there should be a visual aspect to that repentance. My soul. You should unlock that word behold. It's an important word. Here's another lesson. L let me get this. I'll tell you what, if you're taking notes, I'd write this down. Don't let your religious history, ready, interpret your current spiritual condition. Don't let your religious history interpret your current spiritual religion. Look, look with me real quick. Malachi 3 and verse 7. Look at the end of verse number 7 here. He says, uh, but return unto me, and I'll return unto you, say the Lord of hosts. Notice this. But ye say, God's saying, this is what you're saying to me, wherein shall we return? Now that is not a question of where. That is a question of why. They're not saying, God, where should we return? Tell us where we, we should return. No, no, no. That's not the question. The question is a why question. In other words, they did not see that they were in desperate need of repentance. They did not see that they needed to be right with the Lord. And so we see here, it's not a question of where, but a question of why. Israel did not see anything wrong in their relationship with God. They were blinded by their religious history. They were looking back and saying, man, all of these things have gone on in our relationship with God. He's brought us out of Egypt. He's taken us into the promised land. He's taken us to have a kingdom. He's, he's, he's brought us in exile, but he's brought us out of exile. We're rebuilding and all of these religious things that have taken place in their life. Ready? They've interpreted those religious history with their current religious history status, their spiritual status with God. Uh, let me adjust something real quick on my Instagram. They're saying that it's, it's freezing up. So let me just adjust something real quick. Hopefully that'll help guys. So the point here is this, don't let your religious history interpret your current spiritual status with God. L let me say it this way. Don't let what you do for God, ready? Don't let what you do for God blind you by where you're at with God. Don't let what you do for God blind you where you're at with God. In other words, God wants to see your heart before you get in action with your hands. Here's a great temptation you face, Christian. You ready for this? Here's the temptation we face that Israel is facing. Service to God is often interpreted as sanctity with God. Man, that's a good word. Let me say it again. Service to God is often interpreted as sanctity with God. 
In other words, we do so much, right? We're getting, we do so much. Well, this is what I'm doing, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm involved in here, and I'm involved in this church activity, and I'm involved in this ministry, and I'm involved in this, and this, and, and next thing you know, you've got all these things that we find ourselves involved in, and we interpret in our life that that means we are right with God. Let me tell you this, service to God does not mean sanctity with God. You do not interpret your sanctity with God based off of what you do for God. It's not what you do for God is often not really related where you're at with God. Israel was doing a lot. They had temple service reinstated. They were offering sacrifice. They were going to the temple. The Levitical priests were doing their thing. They, they were rebuilding the walls and they were rebuilding the city and they were doing all of these things. But what? They were out with God. They were out with God. Don't let your religious history interpret your current relational status. So what does God do here in Malachi 3? He addresses their relationship, number one. Number two, he addresses their resources. Look at me in verse 8. He says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. So Israel's not only robbed God in their relationship, he's robbed God in their resources. Wherein have we robbed thee? Israel says. God says, In tithes and offerings. So not only did they rob God in their relationship, but they also rob God in tithes and offerings. What is a tithe? A tithe literally in the, um, uh, in the Hebrew means a tenth. It was 10% of the regular income of the Israelites. It was given to God through the temple service. They bring in a tenth of whether it's their flock or their harvest, the first fruits of their harvest. They bring it in and give it to God. That's a tenth. An offering was that which was given above and beyond that. It was additional giving, charitable giving, giving for festivals. Uh, it was often cited as the priestly dues and so um, it, it was giving above and beyond the 10%. In the Old Testament world, the tithe and the offering um, often made up the nation's taxes. It covered the festivals of Israel and it, it took care of the temple services, right? God gave the Levites to take care of the temple. They did not have land, therefore they had no way to have income. So part of that was God saying, you give 10% of what you have to the temple, to the Lord, and then he distributes that through his Levites and to the priests so that they were taken care of. And so that's what the tithes and offerings were in the Bible. And some uh, commentators have estimated that the percentage was above their tithe and offering was often about 23% of their giving, similar to our, our taxes today. But here's the point. Here's the point. A lot of people just focus in on the fact that they're not giving their tithes and offering. They're not giving their tithes and offerings, right? The point is this. The point is they were being unfaithful in their stewardship of God's goods. They were being unfaithful in their stewardship of God's goods. They were not handling the resources of God in accordance with the word of God. They were not handling the resources of God in accordance with the will of God. They failed uh, to handle the resources in a way that honors the word of God. We learned earlier in Malachi 1 and 2, they were bringing the sick sacrifice, the lame, the blind animals, they were bringing a subpar sacrifice. God said, don't bring those kinds of sacrifices, but that's what they were bringing. And then they got to a point where they didn't bring anything at all. Let me tell you this, a slow fade happens. They first started bringing lame and uh, crippled and sick and blind sacrifices, and then it led to them bringing nothing at all. Listen, check the small foxes that ruined the vineyards. Hey, check the small foxes that ruined the vineyards, okay? You need to be careful of those small things that we give way to that end up leading to a coldness and a deadness in the end. Their failure here to bring the tithes and offerings demonstrated their attitude toward God. This is what uh, Alan Ross said, an Old Testament commentator said, their failure to bring these to God or to bring a worthless gift and offering was a clear sign of their ingratitude and disloyalty to him. Wow. The fact that they failed to store God's resources well revealed their attitude toward the God they served. Man, I see people commenting conviction and preaching. I tell you, that's the truth, man. That's what God's addressing here. Here's a lesson I want you to take home with you. How you stored your God-given resources reveals a lot about your relationship with God. How you stored your God-given resources reveals a lot 
about your relationship with God, how you store it. And this is, this is talking about finances here. I'm not going to uh, try to skip around it. God's saying the Israelites at this moment, at this point in history, were not giving God the necessary financial things that God declared for them to give. And then what happened? God, uh, we're going to learn here, there was a result of that. But God is addressing it. You've robbed me financially. But there's so many resources you and I as Christians store. Number one, our time. Do we, here, here's a question. Do we prioritize in a way that shows gratitude to God and respect to God? Wow. Do we store our talents, our abilities, the natural abilities and the spiritual abilities that God gave us? Do we store them in a way that shows God respect and reverence and gratitude to God? What about our treasures, our finances, our pocketbooks? Do we store the things we have in accordance to respect with God, reverence with God, and gratitude toward God. I like the way one commentator said it, Robbie Gallaty. He says, you can always determine where a person's heart is by evaluating their bank statements. You can, you can always determine somebody's uh, um, heart by evaluating their bank account statements. Students, listen to me. I want you to get this. Got to adjust something real quick. I want you to get this. Students watching this. Watch where the person you desire spends their time, their talents, and their treasures. Watch where the person you desire spends their time, their talents, and their treasures. So what does that mean? That means this. Listen. You are, if you're a student here, early stages of uh, connecting with somebody that you're going to try to find to be the love of your life and spend time with for the rest of your life. I understand that. Listen, where somebody spends their time, where somebody spends their talents, and where somebody sends their treasures are a great revealer of what's really going on on the inside. Here's, here's a good word. If you can't store God's resources well, if, if this person that you're desiring can't store God's resources well, you ready for this? They won't store your heart well. If they can't store God's resources well, they won't store your heart well. So before you link up with somebody and connect with somebody, uh, listen to me. You need to see where they spend their resources. Where they spend their resources. Let me fix something. My Instagram is telling me that it's freezing up. That's probably because... Uh, we've got some connection. Our service is lagging here. There we go. So God addresses their relationship. God addresses their resources. And then number three, God addresses their result. Look at verse nine. You are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me even this whole nation. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. The result of their disobedience and poor stewardship was that they were on the receiving end of God's curse. They were on the receiving end of, uh, of a struggle in the relationship with God. The word curse here uh, in verse 9, it, it emphasizes, there's a, uh, an emphasis that is given to this word curse here. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it, it's used the word twice in the text. You've cursed me with a curse. The first is a verb. The second is a uh, noun. You've cursed me with a curse. It's to show emphasis. Well, what in the world is a curse? A curse is uh, here in the text, it's the idea of being removed out from under the blessing of God. Being removed out from under the blessing of God. So because they've not stored their relationship well, and because they've not stored their resources well, uh, God is saying to them uh, here, you are under the curse. You are under the receiving end of my problems. So because they gave out of fragility and not faith, they were experiencing failure in the things that they were doing. Uh, they were, what failure were they experiencing? They were experiencing a dry spell in their land. They were not being able to plant and harvest. They were not being able to bring in uh, uh, the plants that they were 
and they were planting in the ground and they were not being able to reap a great harvest to them. And so what happened is that they were uh, struggling under the curse of God and, and being under that curse of God, it affected their life, not just in a spiritual way, but also in a very, or not just in a physical way, but I mean, not in a spiritual way, but also in a very physical way. Deuteronomy chapter number 28 gives indication to this, that that means that they were out with God. If you're taking notes, write down Deuteronomy chapter number 28, verse number 15. I, I want to read to you what God says here uh, about being out with him. Now, this applied to the Israelites here. This is what God said to them. He says, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall be brought upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shalt thou uh, uh, shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, cursed uh, in the in the fruit of thy land, and uh, the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou Thou goest out, the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto, for to do until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, until he has consumed thee from off of the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with the blasting, and with the mildew, and they shall pursue, pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust from heaven, shall they come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. Uh, so, so what does it say? It's telling us here, listen, God is saying, if you disobey me in the Old Testament world, you're going to face a curse, a curse on your life, a curse on on your family, a curse in your fields. And that is what Israel was experiencing in Malachi chapter 3. They were out with God, and because they were out with God, they were experiencing a curse from God. They were, the heavens were brass, in other words, it wasn't raining, and the land was iron. In other words, when they go to dig, it wasn't even coming up because the land was so parched and hard. What's the lesson here? Listen to me very carefully. Ready for this? Disobedience to God often leads to dryness. Disobedience to God often leads to dryness. That was the result Israel faced physically. They were uh, uh, dry in their land. The heaven was not raining. The earth was parched. They were dry in the land. However, however, not only does it lead to physical dryness, disobedience to God leads to spiritual dryness. Spiritual dryness. See, what is spiritual dryness? You know, if you've ever faced it, you know what spiritual dryness is. It's that parchedness on the inside, that feeling that, man, I'm just not close with God. I'm struggling in my walk with God. I'm, another word we can use is stagnant. I'm stagnant. It's not like I'm not taking anything in. What happens when you got dry soil and you quickly pour water on? It disperses the water. It doesn't soak in. It disperses it at first because the surface is hard. It's like, man, I just, I'm just not taking anything in in right now. Proverbs 16 and 15 says it this way. I like what Proverbs 16 and 15 says. It talks about being right with God. It says, in the light of the king's countenance is life and his favor is as a cloud of the latter rain. In other words, when I'm right with the king, his favor is as the cloud of the latter rain. What's the cloud of the latter rain? It's the rain that comes right before the harvest that matures the crops. Right now, I've got in, uh, in my kitchen a bunch of plants that are germinating. They, they've popped up out of the ground and they're growing. Guess what I do every day? I pour water on them so they grow to a great harvest. The latter rain was the rain that poured down so the plants, after germinating, were harvested up into a plentiful crop. It says when you're right with God, there's not dryness. There's the cloud of the latter rain that gives you what you need so that you are replenished and filled and can mature in your walk with him. You know what's a crazy thought? I want you to think about this. God tells them here, you're not storing your relationship well. You're not storing your resources well. You need to start giving 
physically the tithe and offering, but they also need to start giving in their relationship with God. All the while, hear me, they're facing a famine. They're facing a struggle. They're facing problems here in Malachi 3. It's not like all things are fine and dandy and they're experiencing a surplus. They are facing dryness. They're trying to plant in the ground, but it's not coming forth. They're trying to harvest and nothing's there to be harvested. They are facing desolation and God is saying in those times, you still need to be faithful to give. Man, if that's not an applicable word for today's world. My soul, man. My soul. Uh, often people, I know you're struggling right now. I know that you're struggling. In, some of you are laid off for a time. Some of you are furloughed. Some of you are not receiving a paycheck, whatever it might be. But let me tell you this. Uh, God still desires your obedience. God still desires your obedience. It doesn't matter if you're laid off in the world around you. God desires an active engagement in your spiritual walk with Him currently. I know it's tough. I know it's rough for some of you right now. I know it's a struggle for you right now. I'm not trying to downplay that whatsoever. Hear me. It's hard. I get it. But God still desires your obedience. God deals with their relationship. He deals with their resources. He deals with the result. And lastly and quickly, He addresses their reward. What happens when they get back right with God? What happens when Israel turns in their relationship, turns in their resources, turns in their results, and repents back to God? Look at verse 10. God says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, said the Lord of hosts, and all the nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. My soul. Uh, verse 10, God says here, I'm inviting you to test me. I'm inviting you to test me. Let me say something to you. You don't test God unless he invites you to test him. You don't test God unless he invites you to test him. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, testing God is not really a good thing. Matthew, uh, in chapter number four, uh, Satan is in the process of testing God and trying God in the wilderness. And, and uh, it says Jesus' response in, in uh, Matthew 4 and 7, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. In other words, God is saying it's not good to test him. But God here in Malachi 3 says, I'm giving you a ground to test me with. What's the ground? In your giving. Bring back your giving. Give in your relationship. Give in your tithes and offering. Give in the finances. Why? Because it was a test of faith, not disobedience. Obedience. It was a display of faith, not uh, an act of disobedience to him. Notice what happens. If Israel would turn from their withholding in the relationship with God and the resources, it, it reestablishes their godly stewardship, and God says there's a reward to be given. What's the reward? In verse number 10, he says, I test him if I will not open you the windows of heaven. That word windows there uh, is the word um, floodgates. In Genesis 7 and 11, it's the same word as God opening up the heavens uh, for Noah and the ark and pouring down the waters so that it flooded the land here. So God is saying here uh, that if you if you prove him, you test him, you, you actually repent and get right. And, and for Israel in this time, he's saying you get back with your tithes and offerings. You get back in a right relationship and obey my word. What happens? He's saying here, I will open up the floodgates of heaven. It, there's a twofold meaning here. I will send rain, the floodgates of heaven, but I will also send a multitude of blessings your way. Man, he says there's a reward for obedience. There's a reward for obedience. What else? In verse uh, 11, not only does God say he will provide, but he also says he will protect. Look at verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hope. What's going on? In your land. Your land is, is being destroyed. God says, you get right with me and I will stop that destruction from happening. Through obedience, 
They get to see the hand of God of blessing in their life by what is provided by the floodgates of heaven and what is protected by the decree of God. And then lastly, in verse 12, we see that God brings a physical restoration and all the nations shall call you blessed for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. What a drastic difference from verse number nine, right? Uh, verse 12, God says, you're blessed. Verse nine, he says, you're cursed. You're cursed. You're cursed. And so uh, they're facing a cursing in verse 9. But when they got right with God, they faced what? A blessedness. They faced a blessedness. Not only that, God says you'll be delightsome in your land. You'll have delightsome. The word delightsome there means pleasurable. Your land is pleasurable. Uh, that is um, a complete contrast to chapter 1 and 10 where the Israelites were bringing their offerings and it wasn't well. God says, I have no pleasure in you, saith the Lord of hosts. I have no pleasure in you. Now God says, when you get right with me, you will be pleasurable. You will once again be delightful. You'll have a good reputation between God and man and with all those around you. So God addresses the reward. What's the reward? God says, I will provide from the storehouse of heaven. I will bring down the rain. Not only will I provide, but I will protect you. Not only will I protect you, but there will be pleasure that takes place in your land. My soul, he addresses the reward of obedience. Here's a lesson. I want to give you two lessons that we're going to close. Ready? Two lessons. Number one, Christian, hear me. You can't afford disobedience to God. You can't afford disobedience to God. It costs you more than you're willing to pay. It costs you more than you will pay. You can't afford it. Israelites started slipping slowly and slowly and slowly. No what? They disobeyed God and it cost them. God brought them down to their knees. You can't afford disobedience to God. What else? Here's another lesson. You ready for this? A posture of dependency always sees the hand of God. A posture of dependency in my life. When you're depending, you're depending on your relationship. That's what God addressed to begin with. I'm the Lord God. You're not. You're struggling. What else? He says there, in your resources. You depend on God in your resources. Not only in your resources, but then in the results. I'm giving it up to God and I'm trusting that he is able to give me these things. When I take a posture of dependency, I see God move before, in verse 7, they were spiritually blinded. God says, you need to return to me. And Israel says, where are we going to return to? We've not gone away. They put blinders on in the relationship with God. But now they see God move. The opening of the windows of heaven, the rebuke of the devourer, and the fact that they are a delightsome land. They went from not even being able to see the relationship with God to seeing God provide for them often. Now, I'm not a Naban and claim it prosperity preacher whatsoever. I think God reigns on the just and the unjust, and he lets his uh, believers, his Christians, go through our times so that they can be better. James chapter 1 teaches us that. Uh, uh, faith and patience and patience, let it have a perfect work, and let it perfect in your life so that you will mature thoroughly in your walk with God. But I will tell you this, there is great blessings when you take a posture of dependency with God and you rest upon God in your relationship and your resources and the results and the rewards of your life. You rest in God. All of a sudden you start seeing the hand of God move in your life. Posture of dependency lets you see the hand of God in your life. God addresses the relationship, he addresses the resources, he addresses the results, and he addresses the reward of obedience. He, in closing, let me give you these final words. Don't be guilty in your giving. Don't be guilty in your giving. And I'm not just talking about physical giving. I'm talking about physical giving, absolutely. Christian, hear me. God requires us to give to the work, the ministry, the gospel. He requires giving financially, physically, spiritually, investment, investing spiritually, bringing a untainted offering to God. My soul, even that's convicting, isn't it? I wonder how many of us watching this live feed um, have checked Facebook, have went away, have many other things on your mind. You don't even got to be doing it on Facebook here. When we gather together at the church house, how many times our mind is away from God, our hearts are not pondering the things of God and the things that the preacher is saying. We bring a hindered, lame, a blind sacrifice into the storehouse of God. Don't be guilty in your giving. Experience rightness with God with your time by your priorities, with your talents by the things God gave you, and with your treasures 
in your finances and the things that have value to you. Here's the last word I'm going to say. We have an awesome responsibility to store the things that God gave us and to store them well. We've got an awesome responsibility to store the things God gave us and store them well. God opens up here and says, you have robbed me, Israel. How have they robbed? God says, in your giving. In your giving. You're out with me in your relationship. You're out with me in your resources. You're out with me in your results. You need to depend on me for the reward. I hope this is a blessing tonight. I hope that we've learned something tonight. I hope that each and every one of us take away from this a posture of dependency on God. And uh, I hope we learn, we grow through this. We understand this. What a strange sermon to preach virtually uh, and, and not have an audience. But man, is it a timely word for the Lord. I know those of you that are uh, watching on Instagram, a lot of you hopped on Facebook because Instagram feed kept freezing up. I got to fix some things evidently. But um, I do encourage you to watch. It is on Facebook and the sermon will be on um the app here in a little bit. So just want to encourage you to watch that. Let me say a closing prayer and uh, then we'll go ahead and dismiss from here. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of it. Thank you for how it addresses our life. We thank you, Lord God, for your great benefits of your blessings. Lord Jesus, we pray in all that we do, it honors you in our relationship and in our resources, in the results and rewards of our life that is driven by you, that it comes from you, oh dear God, that you have the glory of it. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for watching. Show some love, like, share this. If you can, share it on your Facebooks uh, and pump it up. People need to hear about God's resources. Thank you, everybody. God bless.